talk about cognition today, um, which is probably a little bit different to what we've been talking about so far. There's been a lot of talk about ticks and a lot of talk about inhibition, um, but I'm taking quite a psychological stance on just the cognition aspects. Um, so I did this um, as my assignment for the Tourette's module that we did in January. Um, and as you know, with a systematic review, you take the best available evidence that you can on that topic area. Um, the, the background was quite, um, in, it, there was quite a, a bias over on the side of cognitive inhibition, which is not really much of a surprise for Tourette's. Um, so I wanted to look at the whole of cognitive ability and not just inhibition and see if we were just putting a bit too much attention on inhibition and maybe there was something else that we were missing. Um, this is the boring slide. This is just so you know how I found my studies and what I did, um, all my search terms, how I limited. And the, the important bit, I suppose, is the bottom bit where um, I was able to decide how I was going to not include studies because it, it, sometimes it's quite difficult to decide how you're going to separate out. So after the, the dropping of the significant impairment of functioning, that was where, if, if studies outlined that that was their way of diagnosing the participants, then that was my criteria for including them. Um, so th that's how I got my studies. I started with 131. I went through the usual process um, and ended up with 12 overall. Um, I don't know whether this is um, a little bit too much to show you, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a picture of just how many areas of cognition were tested in the different studies that I reviewed. Um, and I've got executive function in the first column and then all the other types of cognition, just to show really um, just how broad the different areas are um, and how there are quite a, a tendency, again, like I said, to just test the inhibition um, using the Haling test and the Stroop test um, in particular, um, and then different combinations of them, the Flanker test as well, which has been mentioned earlier. Um, there's quite um, a, a theme of there only being about 20 participants in each of the studies. Um, I think there was only a couple that were over that. So I, I will mention a bit later on about the, just the general underpowering um, aspect. Um, there's also a bit of a combination. It wasn't just people with Tourette's. Quite a lot of them were, but there were also um, comorbid for ADHD and OCD in some of them. And there was a combination of child studies and adult studies, although it was predominantly adult studies. And that's the last three. So just to summarise, like I keep saying, um, there is a bit of a bias to look at the in inhibition, um, the cognitive um, inability to in inhibit responses um, in the literature, but the, there's all sorts of other things that need to be looked at as well. The, how well can people with Tourette's learn explicitly and implicitly? Um, I mean, we've been talking about behavioural reward learning um, and reinforcement um, in the C bit, so that's obviously a bit of an overlap between cognition and behaviour. Um, but the most consistently uh, um, tested area was obviously inhibitory control. Um, so were there any impairments found between the groups? Well, yeah. Um, but I need to stress that they were mild. There were no real obvious um, tests of, of, that showed that there were huge differences between people with Tourette's and the healthy controls. Um, so one study found multitasking, one study found emotional perception, one found social cognition, and one found visual memory, visual spatial memory impairment. Um, I didn't really feel like it was worth placing too much emphasis on any of these because they were only found in the one studies compared to the consistency of the studies that did test inhibitory control to find differences between the groups, which again were mild. Um, so it tended to be the hailing test. Is everyone familiar with the hailing test? I think it's quite well known, but the easiest way to, if you don't know what it is, the easiest way for me to demonstrate it is if I said, the dog chased the cat up the, you really want to say tree, hopefully, that's. <laughs> 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 um, and 
the first part of the test is that they, you, you, you're asked to say that answer, and then the second part of the test is that you're asked to think of something completely different, which is actually really difficult to do. Um, and you have to have a bit of a strategy if you're going to do it. Like you have to, um, like controls tend to have a strategy where they look at an object in the room. So the dog chased the cat up the speaker. That also makes sense, though. So, <laughs> in a way, I've not really seen many dogs chasing cats up speakers, but it still sort of makes sense. Um, so you can see that you've just you've got to really dig around in your long-term memory for a word that fits that sentence that doesn't make sense. And I just think it's difficult anyway, even if you haven't got Tourette's. Um, and there's the diff there's, there's a difference as well between the types of inhibition that the various tests that were used are actually targeting. So I actually think the Stroop test is quite an easy test because you've only got a choice of colour or word. Uh, uh, yeah, colour or word. You, that's it. You're either going to get it wrong because you've, you've got the colour or the word and, and not vice versa. Whereas the hailing test, it's just, like I said, you've got to really dig around for something that fits. Um, and incidentally, it was the hailing test. It was used in five of the tests, in, in five of the studies, and every single one of them found that there were group differences between people with Tourette's and the healthy controls. Um, I think the, this was used in both an adult and a, a child population. Um, they either they made more errors, they couldn't, just couldn't get a word that didn't make sense, um, or they were just taking a long, long time to respond because they were finding it so difficult. Um, the question is, because my sort of, the way the direction I went with this is, should we be looking at verbal memory or, or verbal processing skills in particular um, as the reason why people with Tourette's have got this in inhibitory deficit? Again, the mild needs to be reiterated. Um, or is it just that the hailing task is such a difficult task that it is just the complexity of it and it's nothing to do with the fact that it, it, it's a test that requires verbal skills? Um, and the second thing is that none of the studies actually used a measure of impulsivity, which we've got plenty of measures for impulsivity, um, so I don't really know why none of them used this, because it would have been useful, because I think there is a difference between impulsivity as a personality trait and um, inhibitory control. Um, I think there's a little bit of overlap between them, um, but especially if you've got ADHD, you've, you're probably going to be an impulsive person, um, and should we be blaming these, these, uh, these findings on impulsivity or should we be blaming them on this cognitive inhibitory deficit? So just, just the, the need to respond really quickly wins over getting the answer right. Um, this was another study by Drury et al that found that people with Tourette's found it harder to identify the emotion in um, a voice clip um, I think, it, yeah, it was anger. So they could identify all the other ones, but anger was the one for both adults and children that they just couldn't identify when it was presented with conflicting semantic information. So again, this is, this is a weird one because if someone's got some really great news to tell you, but they're shouting it at you like you've done something really bad, it, it's, it is a tricky one. Like, why That just doesn't make sense to us in, in a natural environment. Um, and you've got to get the task to that level of complexity before you see a difference between people with Tourette's and healthy controls. And I think that's quite important um, in explaining that this is a mild deficit. It is, it's not a, a big thing that we're seeing. Um, but it matches. It matches to what I said before about the hailing or the sentence completion task. It's something to do with verbal memory. It's something to do with auditory processing skills. Um, but yeah, it was this emotional perception was only tested in the one study, which is a bit of a shame because I think it would have been interesting to see this in another one. So, how do the comorbid conditions that were in some of the studies affect these findings? Um, well, every single finding where people with Tourette's did worse than controls, having ADHD was the strongest predicting factor of the performance on those tasks instead of having Tourette's, except for on tests of verbal ability. Then Tourette's was the strongest predicting factor of impairment. So 
maybe, I, uh, maybe I'm just a little bit too wrapped up in my own argument, but I feel like I spotted a little bit of a pattern as I went through these um, findings. Um, yeah, again, it's just the one study, but I, it just it seemed to add on to everything else that I was seeing. Um, I just need to highlight the limitations. All the samples, or, or where they explained where the samples came from, um, were from a specialist clinic, so we are dealing with the severe end of the spectrum, um, and there is a question of whether people, the, the percentage of people that go on and don't really experience much trouble from their symptoms whether we would see the same difference in verbal inhibition with these people. Um, like I said about statistical power, most of the sample sizes were about 20, which I don't really think is high enough. I think it should be a little bit better than that if we're going to be sure about these types of findings. Um, and it was a real shame that there were no, no follow-up studies um, because, like I said, all, all, this, all these things that we're finding out, we need to know whether it's going to change over time, um, especially for the adolescents, the, the child and the adolescent samples. We need to know whether 10 years down the line they're the same as healthy controls or not. Um, so to conclude, um, the deficit is extremely mild um, and circumscribed. Um, you have to really dig around to find it. You have to have some really difficult tasks. I'm pretty sure the health controls had a difficult time just as much as the people with Tourette's, but you've really got to take it to that level to be able to find the difference. So the point that I'm making is that I think there is a slight trend towards verbal processes, not just inhibition in general, verbal processes as highlighted by the hailing test, the emotional perception test, um, and there were just a few of the things that came through, but they weren't significant, so I didn't spend too much time on them. Um, we do need to have a test of impulsivity so that we can be sure that it's not the trait of impulsivity um, that's causing, to, causing us to see this pattern um, over actual inhibition, inhibition deficits. Um, there's the thing as well about how you measure inhibition without measuring other skills, um, which was, I think, was the point of quite a lot of the studies was, can we measure inhibition just on its own without all the other things like verbal ability, which is obviously what the hailing test, you have to use those skills if you're gonna do any good at this test, and the Stroop test, which is obviously your, your visual skills, um, and, and all the others, the, the, even the Wisconsin card saw, it's not strictly inhibition, It's it's, cognitive flexibility, but it is inhibition because you've got to stop doing what you were doing before. So it, how, do, how do we come up with a, a measure that just is just pure cognition? I don't, uh, cognition, inhibition. I don't think there is one. Um, and it wouldn't really be very representative of real life anyway. So I don't really think we should get too obsessed about that. We need longitudinal studies. Um, we need to know whether it's just the severe population that show this difference um, to healthy controls um, because what about if, if all the other people that sort of fade away and just get on with their lives and we never hear about those people? What about if, if they're the same or if they're different? I think it's important that we know that. Um, that's it. <laughs>Hi there, um, I'm Helena Drury and thank you for, for citing some of my, my research there and it's really nice to see um, somebody do a real systematic review of the literature because I think um, the issues you raised about comorbidity and sample selection are really important and things that are hard to, to control for in individual studies. Um, I was really interested in um, the point you made about impulsivity. Um, so in, in the studies of, of mine that you cited, we did generally screen for, for comorbidity, but we did measure um, symptom severity on ADHD and OCD. And I think some of the studies my board also had depression and anxiety um, measures. So I was just interested in if that was something you looked at systematically. It wasn't. Um, the, they were, it was difficult to decide where... Where, to, where the cutoff was going to be in terms of how many different correlations are included. Mm -hmm. um, and the, if just, just to put it out there, that there's quite a, a strict word count <laughs> on my <laughs> um, assignments that I do for uni. So there was a certain amount that I had to, I had to stop at a certain point, basically. Sure. Um, but there, there yeah. was a certain study, um, I, I think it was Zago et al. I don't know whether you know that one. Um, but 
theirs was really mixed up with people with anxiety and depression. It made it really difficult then because there was no separation, there was no control. Um, so I couldn't really get a right lot from that. But Sure, and that's generally why we did screen in our studies. And I think mostly we use the Connors as a measure of ADHD. So obviously that's not just impulsivity, yeah. but that is a bit of a proxy for it. And by and large, we didn't find any relationship yeah. with, with ADHD, with tic severity, with OCD. So, um, so something else going on there. And I also wondered about your point about um, verbal uh, tasks and whether actually the verbal tasks might be measuring complexity. Mm -hmm. So in, task, in sort of experiments where we manipulate the level of task difficulty, <coughs> it's really hard to do that with non-verbal stimuli. So like for example, the, the emotion um, study you cited, um, you, you do need the, the sort of content of the sentence as well as the tone of voice. So yeah. I just wondered if you have, had any comments on the distinction between um, verbal content and task complexity. Um, well, that's the question really that, that I'm getting at, is that I can't tell whether it is just that you've got to get to that level of difficulty where it, it would... I, I, I tried to think of how I would do the test myself and I just thought, these are just so hard. And it, you have really, in fact, just understanding the test when you're reading about it as well, like, what did they actually do? Um, it, it, it's, I think some of it, it's, it's difficult to pick apart whether, whether I'm right, whether it is, a, there's a bit of a verbal component that needs a bit more looking into, mm. or, or whether it is the complexity, because they are really difficult tasks, but sure, I, I really sure. don't know. Yeah, and I think the, the, the key take-home message is the one you highlighted, that these do tend to be very mild, subtle differences. Yeah. It's, there's not, by and large, that much difference between the controls and the threats, and actually that's a really positive message. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay.